Hello, everyone. Welcome to our May Mortgage Quality and Compliance Committee webinar. Sorry, we ran a few minutes over. Um, we appreciate you tuning in and joining us this morning. My name is Samantha Gallagher, and I'm the Member Engagement Director here at the California MBA. Um, if you have not joined us previously on these webinars, we hold them on the fourth Thursday every month on a monthly basis. Um, we highlight a wide variety of compliance and quality assurance topics for the residential lending industry. And if you are a member of the California MBA and you'd like to participate in the committee that comes up with the topics, um, the content and speakers for these webinars, feel free to reach out to me and let me know and we can get you plugged in there. Um, so with that, I'm going to get us started with today's presentation and introduce you to our two speakers. Um, today we have Bill Cleary. Bill is the Vice President of Loan Quality Management at Fannie Mae. Bill leads Fannie Mae's loan level quality control strategy and execution, including loan quality sampling strategy, governance and controls file reviews, data validation, repurchase management, and technology. His prior experience spans many aspects of the mortgage industry, including servicing, capital markets, securitization, and enterprise-wide technology initiatives. Let me move my screen over a little bit. Bill is joined today by Kristen Broadley. She is, serves as the Chief Innovation Officer at QC Ally. She is responsible for driving transformative initiatives by identifying, identifying strategies, business opportunities, and new technologies to enhance competitiveness. Kristen previously spent 12, 20 years at the Rocket family of companies serving in various roles. Most recently, Kristen served as the Vice President of Enterprise Risk for Rocket Central. She spent the bulk of her career within risk management at Rocket Mortgage, with a good portion as the Vice President of Risk Solutions. During that time, Kristen led initiatives and teams in credit risk, origination, quality, monitoring QC, QA, risk mitigation, fraud prevention, and detection, anti-money anti laundering, and servicing risk. Kristen had the opportunity to lead many data-driven transformation initi initiatives that transform processes, certainty, and efficiency. Thank you both for joining us today as our presenters. I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it over to you for today's presentation. Thank you for having us. We're, we're happy to be here. It's like old home week, Bill. I think we did this in November. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Good, good morning, everybody. Yeah. Kristen, glad to be back here with you uh, and the California MBA membership uh, to talk about all things related to loan quality. It, it is exciting. And again, the CMBA, thank you very much for having us. Having us again, this is like part two, of, you know, 2020. Mm -hmm. So we, we definitely appreciate it. Um, so I have a few uh, things that uh, we want to cover today. Um, and then there'll be just some discussion. Uh, between uh, Kristen and I, and, and we'll have some time at the end for questions from the audience. So um, for today's update, I'm gonna start out by talking about, uh, about overall loan quality trends. So what we're seeing in terms of defect rate trends and top defects that are driving those trends. I'll then shift to highlighting you know, what's new from Fannie Mae, including details on um, some recent changes we, we announced for our uh, QC requirements related to pre-funding QC and post-funding QC cycle times. Uh, I'll also provide an update on uh, a topic we discussed last time, which was QC calibrations, or QC of lender QC, which we implemented starting in Q4 of last year. Um, so I'll share some of our early learnings from, from that process. Um, and then lastly, I will preview our upcoming updated publication of Beyond the Guide. That's our best practices manual for a robust QC program. Uh, and I'll share some details of our upcoming in-person QC bootcamp that's going to be occurring in Dallas next month on June 13th and 14th. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to sign up for it yet, I would encourage you. Uh, you're not going to want to miss this one. Um, so why don't we go on to and dig into some of the uh, defect rate uh, information. All right, the, let me talk a little bit about uh, what the graph on this chart uh, is, is telling us. So the graph on this chart represents Fannie Mae's rolling 12 months average final significant defect rate from our statistically valid random post-purchase reviews. All right, so that, now that's a mouthful, so let me break that down a little bit for you. So final defect rate, it's the final defect rate after all corrections and cures, um, by the lender, so it represents only those eligibility defects that resulted in a repurchase or a repurchase alternative. Um, it is a statistically valid random, from a statistically valid random sample. So um, with a reasonable degree, we can extrapolate from any particular vintage sample 
to all of the loans we acquired from that sample. So this really gives us a good sense of the overall level of loan quality uh, that Fannie Mae is, is seeing. It's really our bellwether measure of uh, loan quality. Now, this is publicly available data. You can find it on the capital markets webpage on the uh, Fannie Mae website. It's under credit risk transfer. There's a little single family credit risk management icon that you have to click on, um, but that will take you to uh, information that includes this chart if, you, if you're interested in um, looking at the exact uh, information. So a couple key takeaways from this slide. One is that you know the overall defect rate is still relatively low uh, when you look at it kind of in historical context. And I really think this speaks volumes to um, the effort and vigilance that we have had uh, as an industry in focusing on robust loan manufacturing quality. Um, and it's especially um, impressive considering you know, the whipsaw the industry has gone through over the last 18 months. We've gone from the highest volume in 20 years to the quickest contraction in 20 years. Um, so as an industry, you know, this is something I think we should be absolutely proud of. Now, however, if you zoom into more recent vintages, you do see a jump in the defect rate for the post-pandemic vintages. Um, in fact, the final significant defect rate is as high as it's ever been since the middle of 2015. Um, and, you know, are we okay with that at Fannie Mae? Absolutely not. Um, what's uh, even more um, alarming is the increase that we've seen in the initial defect rate since the pandemic, uh, which we'll dig into a little bit on the, the next slide. All right, so on this slide, you're it's depicting the difference between the rolling three-month initial defect rate, which is the top blue line, and the rolling three-month final defect rate, which is the bottom red line. Um, these are both from Fannie Mae's, uh, the same statistically valid random sample. Um, the, this is just a three-month view. The prior chart was a 12-month view. Um, so the top blue line is the rate prior to lenders having an opportunity to remediate or correct any issues. The red line represents defect rate after cures and corrections from the sample. Um, and one thing you'll notice on the chart on the right-hand side, uh, the more recent vintages are not fully remediated. So those are still sort of a work in progress. That's sort of the shaded column on the, on the right. Um, the other thing I'll note is I don't have numbers on this chart because unlike the previous chart, this is not uh, information that we share publicly but it does give you a sense of kind of relative magnitude and direction. Um, and what we've seen is a steady increase in the initial def defect rate since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and we've also seen that spread between the initial defect rate and the final defect rate increasing. So what is that telling us is when the initial defect rate increases, lenders are doing a good job of remediating the sample. Um, so you might ask, okay, if lenders are doing a good job of remediating the errors, found in the sample, um, despite that high initial defect rate, you know, what's, what's, what's the problem? Um, and, and that would really be a good question because um, there's a couple reasons why this is cause for concern. Um, you know, first, especially in this environment where cost is so important, it, it's operationally in, inefficient. It creates more touches and increases cost. You know, sometimes having two, three, four touches uh, to the same file in order to remediate it after delivery. So, uh, better, cheaper, and faster to get it right on the first go-round. Uh, second, it creates latent risk. And uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Is uh, a lender might be doing a good job of remediating uh, the issues with the loan in the sample, uh, but what about all the loans not in the sample? Since this is a uh, statistically valid random sample, we can extrapolate the results to all the loans we acquire. So. The other loans not in the sample still have that high initial defect rate. So, where does the latent risk come in? Fast forward a year and a half, two years from now, the Fed has continued to raise interest rates. Unemployment has increased. We start to see increases in delinquencies, and you know one of these loans gets selected for a, a delinquent loan review um, that previously wasn't in the sample. Are you as confident at that point in time 
that you'll be able to remediate the, the origination issue at that point. Um, you know, if you had to go back to the bar for something, it's going to be much more difficult to cure a year and a half, two years out. Or what if it was a complicated transaction um, and, uh, you know, the processor and underwriter who works on the deal are not with your organization anymore? Would, would someone else be able to make heads or tails of it? Um, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is I think we all know that the further you get away from origination, right, the messier you can get and the more difficult it can get to remediate issues. Um, so really, ultimately, this really under, underscores the importance of actively managing both your initial defect rate and your final defect rate. Right? It helps reduce costs and mitigate future risk. So, um, Bill, can, uh, I pause you? can I pause you for a minute? Yeah. That was a lot of information. So I just want to kind of like circle back on, on a couple things that I think are really important from a QC perspective. Like I, I've lived and breathed QC for so many years of my life. Um, it's oddly enough a passion of mine, I think for a whole bunch of folks that are in the QC space, not you included, you know, when you've done this for a long time, um, it's just one of those things that you stick with because it's interesting and engaging and it changes over time. Like you saw the the defect rates from 2008 when they were at their high, their final high, and you saw how well we've done, you know, historical lows of 2015. Yes, we're definitely inching up, and so that's cause for concern. But I want to circle back on a couple things about initial versus final, because um, Fannie Mae is starting to really focus on that initial rate, right? Because it is truly, it is that it, if it, unless of course it's invalid, which happens, you know, it happens, but happens rarely. Um, that initial rate is truly the kind of the, the measure of the manufacturing quality of any shop. And so paying attention to that initial rate, whether or not you can cure it, um, um, is, is very important. You can identify trends, um, you can you know, identify opportunities in your manufacturing process. And um, yes, you can cure and reduce liability, but you're right, there's a cost to it. There's time spent on it, contacting clients, um, impacts the client experience. You know, um, when you're looking for, you know, referrals, when you're looking to, you know, talk to folks when they're going to their next home, if you have to keep going back to that well post-closing in order to try and cure defects, you can really, um, you can uh, uh, have an impact on that relationship with, with that borrower, with that client. Also, you're right, um, if the loan defaults and it gets picked for, you know, a default review, as, as timers as timers go, right? If, you, if you're still in that 36 months, it, it's harder and harder to find those clients, talk to those clients, convince them to help you if they can. So that initial rate, that final rate is, is yes, it's subject to cure, it's subject to um, remediation, but that initial rate is what folks should be looking at when they look at how do I assess the, the, the manufacturing health of my shop. And, and it is really something that Fannie Mae has been uh, focused on. Uh, Bill, your sound keeps going. I don't know if it's like that for everybody, but your sound seems to be going in and out. I don't know if you're not, or maybe not close enough to your speaker or what. Kristen, was it all like that for you on your end? Yeah, I'm getting a little bit, a little bit of of, of soft. So, Bill, lean in. We want to hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that a better? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so speaking of leaning in, Fannie Mae is really leaning into, you know, the initial defect rate and managing around that. Um, and, you know, um, really, you know, a lot of our performance management with, with, with lenders focuses on how they're doing on that initial defect rate and what that looks like. Uh, for, for, for many of the reasons you articulated, Kristen, um, the, um, the other thing we, we also observe you know, as you talked about going back to the client or re-engaging the client and the client experience, um, we, you know, we also see that um, in terms of issues where there are documentation issues, you know, it's oftentimes, uh, you know, organizations don't have robust tracking or reporting around, okay, was this like a, a shipping department issue and we had the document and we just didn't deliver it or did we have to go back to that client? So, you know, it's really hard to get to that level of granularity um, and so, you know, kind of that is also creates challenges, I think, for organizations. So really understanding like that initial defect rate and what's driving the issues is, is also important. Great. Um, you know, uh, should we should we pivot into some of the 
the the the top defects we see driving that initial rate at this point. Um, yeah. So uh, this slide is showing our our top ten initial significant defects uh, from that same random sample for Q3 and Q4 of 2022. Um, the dark bars represent appraisal related defects. The uh, orange bars represent employment or income related defects. And uh, the, the purplish, maybe I guess it's future you would call it, bars are uh, represent um, uh, liability re related errors. And uh, I, I, if you recall, we went over a similar chart uh, the last time we, we were all together. Um, and the, when we looked at it then, that was uh, more focused on the 2021 vintage. And we saw that uh, self-employment income calculation errors and self-employment uh, documentation errors were, were at the top of the leaderboard. Um, and appraisal errors were not even on the, uh, on the chart. And so what's interesting as we've you know, moved into a purchase market, rates have increased, some housing markets are adjusting uh, because of that rapid rate increase. Um, you know, appraisal related errors are making, making up three out of our top five uh, initial defects that we see. Um, and so go ahead, Kristen, were you gonna say something? I was, I was gonna add, and, and you know, you can correct me if this, this context is, is um, uh, out of scope, but I think too, when you look at like 2021 and, and um, you know, a portion of 2022, uh, the calculation errors were qualification errors. And there were, you know, pandemic error guides that were put in place that were difficult. Um, they, were, they were hard, they were complex. Um, they were hard to, you know, meet those standards as a result of the pandemic. And I think we saw a lot of those hit top of the charts, especially as, um, you know, Fannie Mae and others were getting through all of those reviews from that time frame. So I think it makes sense as, as those things were, you know, sunsetted, um, that there, there was going to be something new because those guides around income and qualification um, became simpler as a result, you know, for the economy getting back to work. So I think that that may have impacted it as well. And I think, yeah, with these these defects, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I read it somewhere, that you are into the like Q4 of 2022 and, and moving into 2023 on some of these reviews. And you're right, we're in a purchase centric market. So it makes sense that appraisal starts hitting, you know, top of the funnel. That's correct. Our, our kind of the random sample that these reviews are from are, you know, we've pretty much wrapped up uh, end of 2020, 2022, and now are into the first couple of months of 2023. So that timing is correct. And yeah, as, as you point out, I think we, you know, um, I think we're all glad to see some of those temporary COVID policies, uh, you know, uh, get retired. Um, you know, I mean, there was, I think we had 70 uh, credit policy changes that we implemented in, you know, I think the span of 12 months. Um, you know, uh, for the industry to digest that, um, you know, and, and digest it fairly well, it was pretty amazing, I think. Um, and that goes back to the first chart we looked at, right? You know, while we have seen some increase in the overall defect rate, you know, you have to put that in the context of everything that the industry was dealing with at the time. Um, and so, again, I think it just speaks to the the, the focus that the industry continues to have on uh, you know robust low manufacturing quality. Absolutely. Um, I'll talk to some of the other uh, you know like the types of uh, income calculation errors we're seeing. So it, we're seeing less self-employed and more base income calculation errors, um, and uh, uh, some more rental income calculation errors as well. Um, you know, the base income calculation errors are generally around scenarios where, you know, um, maybe the uh, bonus or overtime or shift differential pay has not been like fully established. Um, so it can represent a little stretching, right, to, you know, kind of make that purchase transaction work. Um, and the rental income calculations typically tend to be more around like some more complex cash out transactions uh, that we see. Um, the, so why don't we shift to talk about uh, a little bit about uh, some of uh, what's, what's been new from Fannie Mae uh, in the last few months. We're heading into pre-fund. I'm all about yeah. the pre-fund. 
exactly. Um, so uh, earlier this year, we announced more prescriptive requirements for uh, pre-funding QC sample size. So the pre-funding QC sample uh, must be the lesser of 10% of the prior month's originations for 750 loans. Uh, both component and full reviews count towards the total. Uh, and, you know, I just wanted, wanted to spend some time sharing uh, some of the reasons why we made the change and, you know, also talking about, you know, what, what we see as the power of, of pre-funding QC. Um, you know, as we were kind of reflecting on the increase that we are seeing in uh, defect rates uh, across the industry, you know, we observed that um, some lenders were really not uh, uh, adjusting their pre-funding QC as loan quality performance deteriorated, and, and we're not really taking advantage of that, that power of that pre-funding QC to help mitigate issues uh, and identify issues early. Um, so we saw this as an opportunity to really reinforce the importance of this, this tool. Uh, it's such a powerful risk mitigation tool. Um, and, and Kristen, I know you're very passionate about it. So wanna hear some of your, your comments uh, on how you see pre-funding QC can be, can be optimized within you know, an, an origination shop. So thank you, because you're right. I'll get on my soapbox right now. Um, so, you know, when you think about, when you think about sampling methodology and you think about what it tells you, the, the post fund random review is really, um, to, you know, tell a lender, a shop that this is your overarching defect rate, right? So trying to, um, uh, understand trends within that sample is very, very difficult because it's not structured that way. Pre-fund, um, the power of the pre-funding process is your ability to create sampling methodology, governance, um, you can uh, work with your first line folks, your operations folks to determine what risks there are you know, in, your, in your manufacturing process um, and go ahead and sample those. With component reviews, if you're worried about income, you can structure a sample that's a component review where you're conserving resources because you're only looking at say that self-employment income. Um, you can structure a, a, a program that looks at different risk components over the course of three months, six months, a year, depending on your risk tolerance. So you can start to structure that program to tell you one, um, how what's the what's the health of your manufacturing process? How is it? How are folks doing? Celebrate when you know when your first line operations folks do well. There's a lot of things that we do well. But we're able to like discount double check with a pre-fund process, a robust pre-fund process to tell us those things. So structuring those programs, leveraging, you know, the resource efficiency of component reviews really lets you get ahead um, and understand what the healthier process is before you're looking in the rear view, before you're looking at your post-fund results, which at that point, um, you may have to realize liability. You can yeah. fix these things in pre. You can um, bubble up to your executive teams when things are, are going wrong. And you can also bubble things up when they're going great. You, you said it, right? You know, um, 70 changes, overarchingly, the industry did extraordinarily well. We want to make sure in QC that we don't forget to celebrate those wins. And you can really do that when you're leveraging your pre-fund pre, pre process. That's why it's truly, the, you know, the power of a pre-fund process. It is, it, is, it is a way to understand your risks before you have any liability. Yeah, I think in terms of like highlight, when you talk about highlighting wins, right, it really is a profit preserver. Um, and, you know, that's one thing that, you know, as uh, QC professionals that we can highlight to, you know, our management is that, okay, here's, here's you know, X number or X percentage of issues we identified before we funded the loan, right? And then, you know, how much, how, you know, the X dollars that, that has potentially saved the organization, right? So it can be very powerful from that perspective as well. Um, you know, I think there's also, you know, the connection you can make between um, if you are seeing certain repetitive issues in post-funding QC, how do I structure my pre-funding QC sample, uh, you know, to really drill down to those, to those issues and that, that part of the process, right? So, um, and in those instances, uh, the you know sometimes people when they see uh, like a high pre-funding uh, rate, um, you know they might get alarmed. But it really depends on what's the objective of your, of your sample. And those issues, you know, a high rate is good because it means you're finding the issues 
uh, you know, pre-funding uh, that you identified in post-funding. Um, so, you know, those, you know, and then, you know, obviously you want to address those issues and, and fix them and, you know, the rate would go down over time. But, you know, initially that, that a high pre-funding rate in that scenario would not necessarily be a bad thing because that was your objective to find it. So um, I think having that perspective and being able to communicate that perspective um, within your management ranks, um, you know, uh, we have similar scenarios here, you know, that, that we have to do. It's like, no, this is it's not, a high rate here is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, That's right. If you think about it, when you have um, when you have confidence in your process, when you know what your defect rate is for any component, when you have identified systemic issues or you're just monitoring those things that may exceed your risk tolerance if something goes bump in the night, right? Process, tech, people. These are, you know, you can sample all of these things in your pre-fund process. And we're in a place of scarcity right now where, um, you know, we're not getting as many loans in the door. So how do we how do we think about lending at the margins? How do we feel about, you know, affordable home ownership and all of those things? If you have complete com confidence in your manufacturing process, you can lean into those programs. You know, so, you know, from that perspective, not only is it revenue retention, but it can be revenue driving. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and to your point, right, it really hits on three levels of uh, helping you to mitigate risk around process, around new products, right? Uh, you can design samples around that, um, and around people, right, around staffing. If you have newer staff, you can design samples around that, or staff where you're having performance issues around. Um, so it really is a very powerful risk mit mitigant tool. All right, um, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about the other change we announced earlier this year, and that was related to uh, the timing of the post-funding QC cycle um, on the next slide. And uh, we adjusted the timing of the post-funding QC cycle from uh, 120 days to 90 days. And then we eliminated many of the like overly prescriptive interim steps. So we had 30 days for selection, 60 days for review and rebuttal, 30 days for reporting, uh, we, we we simplified it to just 90 days and, you know, we don't care how you get it done, just get it done from, you know, start to finish in that 90 day period, right? Um, the And again, I want to share kind of just the perspective on uh, some of the reasons behind the change. You know, one was to really support a more timely feedback loop on issues and trends that you're seeing in post-closing um, and really, you know, kind of narrow that. Um, you know, we kind of felt this, this is, you know, aligns with where a lot of folks already are, right? So we're seeing many, many lenders, you know, we're already completing their uh, post-funding QC cycle, uh, you know, within 90 days or well within 90 days. Um, and it's really been a policy that has been out there for years at Fannie Mae, so over five, maybe 10 years, right? And, you know, technology has changed, processes improved, the, the industry continues to always iterate to more efficiency and better. Um, so we felt like, you know, since to some degree it was, you know, Fannie Mae catching up a little bit with where folks already were um, in the process. And, uh, you know, it's something I, I will share, it's something we've been thinking about for a while and just kind of sort of waiting for the right timing because uh, when we were going through the post-pandemic refi boom and everybody was stretched with capacity, um, we were like, okay, well, it's not going to be that well received if we're narrowing timelines in that environment and you know folks were having trouble so in some instances you know meeting the 120 day timeline and you know for for good reason right given uh you know once in 20 year uh volume boom um and then you know last year there was a lot of folks that were you know rationalizing their organization and structures so we, again we felt like okay the timing just wasn't right so um we feel like this year the timing things are a little settled down in the industry not entirely, but much better than they were in the last couple of years. So and we felt just the timing was right to make the change as well. Well, and I think um, this published in April, if I'm if I'm if I'm correct, Eric. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, it was earlier this year, um, March April timeframe. Yep. Yep. And so, and you're you're giving the industry until September first um, right. to completely implement. So you know, there's a lot, there's some opportunity there for practice runs to make sure that you're able to meet these timeframes. I, I, I appreciate that the, you know, individual time, you know, timelines were eliminated. 
Um, it lets it lets folks uh, determine what they you know want internally, how they want to process these things, and it just gives, gives them the overarching. Um, so it creates flexibility versus you know you're going to get audited if you miss this 30 days or if you miss this 60 days and and those types of things. So that flexibility I know is appreciated. I know the shortened timeline. Um, you know I think folks you know some folks are worried, some folks are not. Um, but again, you've got some runway in order to make sure that um, you're in compliance by September 1st. Yep. Um, and I'm sure you've got great partners like QC Ally that, could, that can help with that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We will help anyone who needs to get to that time frame. Um, all right. Uh, I'd like to uh, shift gears here a little bit and talk about uh, our upcoming uh, updated publication of Beyond the Guide uh, on our next slide. The beyond the um, oh, sorry, uh, I forgot about uh, QC calibrations. Let me uh, um, let me talk about that first. Um, I really wanted to get to my plug, my shameless plug for for boot camp, which I'm super excited about. Um, the I, I QC calibrations is a process we implemented at the uh, end of uh, last year. We talked about it when we met in November, and I just wanted to share some of the things that are working well. Um, and uh, some areas we see for improvement. And so, uh, first off, from the calibrations that we've conducted to date, um, you know, the vast, vast majority of outcomes have been as expected. So that's great. Again, it points to the, you know, level of low manufacturing quality in the industry being so robust. The, um, and where we saw some unexpected outcomes uh, you know, lenders were generally very receptive to the feedback uh, that we've had. Um, the collaboration between, you know, my, my team and the teams we're engaging with uh, uh, at, our, at our lenders has been, uh, you know, phenomenal. We have multiple touch points throughout the process to keep things running smoothly. And, you know, lenders are really leaning into it as a learning opportunity. Um, and they've really provided us feedback that, they enjoy or are really benefiting from the insights that they're getting into Fannie Mae's QC process. Um, Cause to some degree, you know, some of that has been a little bit of a black box for folks um, or they've had to sort of kind of figure it out from the results they're getting back. Um, and uh, really, you know, gives them insight to how we look at certain issues and how we're approaching certain issues. Um, and I have to say from my perspective, the uh, you know the the feedback we get from lenders uh, in the process is is in, invaluable as well. So it's a learning process for us. Um, you know the at times we're we're identifying uh, issues that um, you know my review team may have missed and uh, the the lender in their QC post funding QC identified because you know we're looking at the same sample. So it's definitely a learning opportunity for CMA. We can take those. Uh, items to our our team, uh, highlight them, identify if it's a training issue, a process issue. So it really is, um, you know, both sides truly calibrating against one another. Um, so it's very collaborative. Um, and we've also gotten feedback that, you know, kind of the, the uh, lenders are appreciating kind of the, just the structure of the process. Um, you know, it's very well laid out. We, we kind of identify up front what we're going to do. Um, and the um, getting sort of instead of like piecemeal feedback throughout the process, uh, lenders have also uh, communicated that they appreciate, you know, we're putting together kind of a, a package of, of uh, feedback at the end that's sort of uh, encompassing, all encompassing. Um, and so they, they, we've gotten good feedback on that uh, as well. So I had I had the extraordinary opportunity to go through many, many, many calibrations with Fannie Mae, and it's something. Um, that we look forward to. I know it sounds crazy, you know, but we we looked forward to it. One, because it was a partnership. It was collaborative. It was communication back and forth. It was opportunities for everyone to do better. Um, and um, and the Fannie Mae folks that we worked with really approached it that way. So it's not, you know, adversarial. It's not acrimonious. It's not any of those things. Um, when when the industry does better, when they when they know more, and I learned a lot. You know, going through those calibrations when the industry does better, Fannie Mae does better. We're all our true north truly is quality. You know, across the industry, it helps it helps the industry itself. Um, it creates stability. It helps consumers. All of those things. So I'm I'm thrilled to hear 
that it's going so well. Because something that we talked about, I think in November, like you know, this was this was really getting rolling. So I'm thrilled to hear um, and thank you for bringing this feedback here to kind of talk about what you're seeing as this has rolled out because it it aligns with my experience. Great, that's that's awesome to hear. Um, now we have we have have uh, identified some areas for uh, or opportunities for improvement. Um, you know, and these are these are a few things we've seen um, consistently over the you know um, we've done about you know uh, almost 20 calibrations uh, so far, and we'll do you know we've got another 10 in progress, and we'll we'll have a total of 60 by the end of the year. But these are some of our early learnings um, that I wanted to share with this group, um, so that you know you can benefit from uh, even if you're not getting a calibration some of the, the trends we're seeing and, and, and can you take it back to your own organizations and you know do a checkpoint um, in your processes. So um, one area that we see is the, the, the selling guide requires lenders to notify Fannie Mae within 30 days of confirmation uh, that uh, an eligibility defect was identified you know, within the lender's QC process. And we've seen some instances of either late reporting or non-reporting. So, you know, I think this is a good call, uh, opportunity for you know everybody on the phone to really you know checkpoint your controls and governance related to uh, self-reporting. Ensure that they're in good order, and um, you know make sure you have uh, you know kind of uh, not only that they're uh, you've got good controls and governance, but you've got good checkpoints to make sure the the controls are operating well in that regard. Um, we, we also see some instances where lenders have rated uh, the exact same issue with different uh, levels of severity. So for example, um, the same exact issue in one instance may be identified as an eligibility defect. And in another instance, um, it's identified as a, you know, uh, a moderate defect or a lower level uh, severity defect. Um, so again, this is really an opportunity um, just to ask you yourselves, like, do I have a well-documented criteria uh, to apply when assessing the severity of defect? And you know, is it is it not only well-documented but easy for my staff to understand, right? Um, and how do I ensure that they're applying that criteria uh, consistently? Um, so again, another trend we see, and so wanted to be able to share that with folks here, so they everybody can learn from some of our early learnings. Um, we we. The, we, we're also seeing very good alignment at the highest severity of defects. So at el eligibility defects, um, we line up very well with lenders and lenders line up very well with Fannie Mae. Um, however, um, we do see somewhat less identification of lower level severity defects. So more moderate defects. Fannie Mae tends to identify more of those than we see lenders identifying. Um, and you know this is really um, it's really important to pay attention to those more moderate level defects because they they generally uh, you know tell you you know where your next set of uh, eligibility defects are coming from right especially as market shifts so you know we talked about this earlier but we really saw that play out in 2021 and 2022 um, you know appraisal related defects were you know nowhere near the top of the leaderboard in 2021 for our um, significant defects, but if you looked at you know our top findings or moderate defects, um, appraisal related defects uh, made up uh, I think it was like one out of the top six. Um, well, you fast forward to 2020 22, the market shifts and those same errors now are impacting eligibility. So um, that's one area where if you're thinking about what your future risks are. Those moderate findings can really tell you where where your next set of eligibility errors might be coming from. Yeah, it's I, I consider it the canary in the coal mine. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and then um, the one other uh, issue that we um, or item that we notice somewhat consistently is uh, around uh, uh, defect taxonomy, and so. Um, you know, this is one one area I would um, ask folks to really go back and think about your naming convention for for defects, and you know, 
is it specific enough? Does it help make issues actionable? Um, we see this pretty consistently as it relates to uh, appraisal related defects. Um, somewhat with credit related defects, not as much, but we do see it there occasionally. But really, does your defect taxonomy or you know your naming convention, uh, to use a more simpler language, uh, does it allow you to quickly identify the root cause issue and drive action? So I'll give you an example. Uh, we often see very broad defect names such as uh, collateral assessment does not support appraised value. Um, well, that in and of itself doesn't really help you understand, well, what was the specific issue with the appraisal? Um, so, you know, it's be better to be naming or having a defect taxonomy that is much more specific so you can drill down to, um, you know, for example, was it inappropriate comparable sales due to location or, you know, dissimilar comps due to site characteristics? Um, so really, you know, looking at your naming convention and utilizing it to really help you um, be able to kind of identify and communicate more quickly around what the issues you're, you're seeing. Um, we also see this, I'll give another example in the credit space. Sometimes we'll see a, a broad defect name such as outside of DU tolerances. Well, that can apply to both income and liability. So you, you don't really even, you, you, don't, you don't get a good understanding of what was driving that error. So um, really getting to the, the specific issue in your taxonomy or naming conventions uh, really helps you to more efficiently manage your risk and drive down to the issue. Yeah, that's it's really helpful. It's it's really helpful. Um, you know your your ability to to move, um, you know, to be agile in order to address any systemic issues, right? With your your ops folks is truly reliant on your ability to identify it and root cause it. So you know, um, and you can't do that when you have overly general, um, um, you know, uh, defect taxonomy. So you know, from that perspective, drilling down into what that is so that you can aggregate it and you can say this is a trend or it's not. Um, that it's it's very important, and I just wanna I just wanna I know we have a few slides to get through, and I think we've only got about 13 minutes left. I know we want to leave room for a couple questions, so I'm just I'm just doing a time check for us. Okay, so I'll make this real quick. Uh, the the next the next couple slides are really just shameless plugs for some things we have coming up. So um, we've got an updated Beyond the God that we're publishing in July. Um, It'll be a little uh, easier to use and more intuitive. Uh, when I and and it's a great um, uh, tool for um, can be used in a comprehensive fashion for an overall QC program, or the chapters can be used on a standalone basis. I do want to point out that we'll have an expanded action planning section to really help folks with uh, drilling down to root cause identification, uh, success metrics, measurements. How do you circle back to make sure that you know you have the results um, you expected and the thing you actually changed was the thing that actually drove those results? So that's coming in July, excited about that. Um, but on the next slide, the thing I'm super excited about is our first in-person boot camp uh, since the pandemic, June 13th and 14th here in Dallas. Um, it's gonna be solely focused on QC. So past boot camps have had multiple tracks. Uh, underwriting, condos, you know, we really want to focus uh, uh, as uh, at Fannie Mae on, uh, you know, kind of QC and, um, you know, kind of getting back to those fundamentals. Um, and so, Kristen, I know you've had a lot of uh, experience with boot camp, so would love to hear your your perspective as someone who's participated um, in, in, in boot camp with past organizations. Yeah, I would I would love to. And by the way, you know, to you know our webinar attendees, Bill Cleary is not paying for me for this endorsement. No, it's I, I will absolutely get behind the shameless plug here. So um, boot camp is great. Um, you know, uh, for any lender shop, any QC organization, because it's peer to peer. So one of the things um, that happens, you know, in our role, you know, in our industry, is we can get a little isolated, and so we don't necessarily have that opportunity to get in a room with all of the QC folks, with so many QC folks across the industry and have a safe space to have greatest conversations about opportunities, best practices, doing all of those things. Hey, this worked for you, this worked for you. Are you seeing these same defects? How are you remediating it? How are you looking at it? Um, how are you 
What does your governance monitoring program look like? All of these things, um, having that opportunity to talk to peers in smaller shops, bigger shops, you may be growing, you may be shrinking a little bit, whatever it happens to be, um, you know, how you put action planning together, all of those things, you can ask the questions. Again, it's a safe space. And networking amongst, you know, QC folks is so important because the relationships you make there, they don't end there. I can't tell you the number of people that I've met that I'm able to pick up the phone and I have that relationship with and we can talk, we can commiserate, and then we can grow together. So um, I am a huge advocate for, for the boot camp. I've, you know, I've done them for a, a number of years. Um, and so if you can, it will be a benefit to you and your teams. Great, thank you for that. And I, I, I like, I did not pay Kristen for that, for that endorsement. <laughs> The, uh, and then the other thing I just want to mention, if you are a lender who is not yet approved by Fannie Mae, but you're in that process or working towards that process, um, you know, we do have a few uh, spots available uh, for those situations because it's a great way to prepare yourself uh, for that approval process. So um, if that's your situation, email boot underscore camp at Fannie Mae.com, mention this webinar, and we'll see if we can squeeze you in. Now I do, I do want, I know we've got, uh, maybe we, we have a couple minutes to talk about one thing that I do want to bring up because it's top of mind. We're seeing article after article. So, you know, don't want to necessarily put you on the spot um, before we get to questions, but I think we should probably, you know, clear the air a little bit. Repurchases. Let's, you know, talk about repurchases. You're seeing news articles, you're seeing all these things. Can you bring a little, you know, clarity to, to, you know, the repurchase market? Sure, I uh, would love to address that. It certainly has been in a lot of the trade press uh, over the last few weeks. Um, you know, and first and foremost, I, I want to start by saying, you know, Fannie Mae has not adjusted its process or approach. Um, you know, we are still ardently adhering to both the letter and spirit of the Ref and Warrant framework that, you know, we as an industry established coming out of the, you know, the, the last great crisis. Um, and uh, you know, we 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 definitely saw an increase in repurchase issuance, uh, particularly in the first half of last year, uh, and that was really the large volume of originations from the post-pandemic refi boom making their way through through the system. You know, uh, to use a crude analogy, that that rat has pretty much you know made its way through the snake, um, and since that time, we've seen a steady decline in repurchases issued. We're at about half the issuance volume that we were at at the recent peak in Q2 of last year. Um, you know, what really has shifted is external factors that are, you know, beyond Fannie Mae's control, right? So the repurchases from the 20 and 21 vintages, which had three and a half to 4% note rates, um, were being issued last year when prevailing market rates were six to 7%. And, you know, so that, that interest rate differential creates a tremendous pricing impact um, when lenders go to, you know, kind of offload those repurchases in the stretch and dent market. Um, and it also created a scenario where, um, you know, there wasn't the ability that we saw in prior years when rates were steadily declining to sort of refinance the loan and, and, and fix the issue during the, the refinance process. So, you know, there was not, there was another option of, of correcting the repurchase was taken off the table, um, and I don't, I don't want to diminish the cost here for lenders. I realize it, it's a, it's painful, but at the same time, this is really an issue that's that's already self-correcting. Uh, Eighty to eighty-five percent of the repurchase repurchases we've issued since January have been from the 2022 vintage. So already we're seeing that interest rate differential between repurchases issued and pre prevailing market rates narrow substantially. I imagine over the next quarter uh, or two, we'll see those converge uh, back to kind of that normal level again. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's it's good to hear it's decreasing. It's good to see defects are changing. It's good to know that you're you're you know concluding 2022. So I think that's that's immensely helpful when we think about what we're going to look at from a forecast perspective in the near future. And then Sam, I don't know. Right, yeah, oh, thank you. Hi. That was a great presentation. You guys had a lot of content to cover, but we appreciate you taking the time. Um, yeah, if anyone, we do have a few minutes. So if anyone has any questions there, you should see a Q&A dialogue box on your little 
um, on the side panel there. So if you see that and you'd like to send in a question, please do. We do. We have had one come in already that I'll grab really quick. This came in at the early in the beginning of the presentation. Is there a significant defect rate between origination channel, retail, wholesale, and correspondent? Uh, we do track by uh, origination channel, um, and we do track defect by origination channel. That's not something we you know kind of publish publicly. But if lenders want to understand, um, you know, how the, you know um, retail is doing versus correspondent or wholesale, that's certainly information that we can provide and have discussions around. Um, so either contact your QC specialist if you don't have a QC specialist uh, assigned to you, then you know, contact your um, you know a business account management team lead. Um, and you know, so we can provide that information and walk through it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll monitor for another minute or so, but I haven't seen any other ones come in. Um, and just as a reminder, a quick note we are recording this webinar, it will be available on our mortgage quality and compliance committee page on the cmba.com. So, it should be available in the next day or so. You can, go, you can go ahead and reference it there. Um, but I don't see any other questions coming in for right now. It was such started, a started well, a few minutes after. We're ending a few minutes early, so that works out. <laughs> Thank you, Bill and Kristen, for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, our next webinar will be held on, I think it's June twenty second. That's the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, but other than that, I think that's all we have. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time, and thank you everybody for joining. Kristen, thanks. Bill, any last thoughts before I close out? Um, for me, I just want to say thank you to the California MBA membership. Uh, Great to be here again, uh, talking about loan quality. So, so thank you all. And and I will ditto. Um, Bill, it's great. It's always a pleasure to do these with you. I have so much fun. And thank you, you know, to the California MBA for making it possible. We appreciate you. Thank you both. We appreciate you. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Goodbye.